right. Thank you, everybody. We are having a, this is a special episode of the Liberty Dad podcast, a discussion on politics and culture. We are doing this in front of a live studio audience. I've always wanted to say that. And finally, I get to say that. So hooray for me. I have finally made it in the media. Um, right. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. So uh, live studio audience. So, you know, no pressure. Um, you know, but you're used to speaking to crowds, so I think we're going to be good. We have Chase Oliver here. He is the presidential candidate for the Libertarian Party, the official one. We're going to be discussing some things today, and we're going to have, hopefully, a little bit of fun. So, let's get started. Let's talk about the Pride event that, we, that brought you down here in the first place. So, yesterday, so today is Sunday. Yesterday, Jacksonville had their River City Pride, of course, since our candidate also happens to be a gay man, I said, let's get him there and talking to people that, you know, like we, we've got to get, you, you go to places where you fit for sure. You can't miss those ones. Of all places that you can't miss, the ones where you're a fit, that's where you go. And that's where I wanted to get our candidate. Plus we were gonna table there anyway. And we had a great crowd yesterday, not only for the Pride event itself with lots of people that Chase will tell us about talking to, but also for the Libertarian Party. We had a good 10 or 12, I didn't get an exact count, but we had a good 10 or 12 people there. So it was phenomenal in terms of tabling events because look, sometimes it's hard to get you all out to places, okay? You know, but you guys came out and we had a great crowd at our tent. We had a lot of conversations going on. So Chase, go ahead and start with telling us how the event went for you, the people that you talked to, those kind of things. Yeah, so uh, <clears throat> as you mentioned, I came down here to participate in River City Pride. It was part of a campaign swing that I had done through the Carolinas, obviously to see the storm damage from Helene, uh, make my way down here to Jacksonville, of course, to enjoy the Pride event. And it is important for us to be out there and visible as a political party at all kinds of outreach events. Um, you know, one of the reasons why uh, in addition to being an LGBTQ candidate that I'm so interested in getting out to Pride events is that it was a Pride event that actually made me start my journey into becoming a libertarian. And maybe we started some people's journey yesterday, right? So we talked to lots of different voters across the political spectrum, um, you know, left, right, and center. Uh, people who, you know, were interested in, hey, what's the Libertarian Party offering? What are you guys all about? Uh, and, you know, I must have said the word non-aggression principle about a thousand times yesterday in describing what our philosophy is and what the core beliefs are that we have as a party. And we had a lot of really constructive conversations. I can tell you about one that uh, I mentioned to some of the folks here uh, a little earlier. We had a person who was literally at the tent holding a Harrison Wall sign, like mm -hmm. holding a right. sign of the Democratic candidate for president and vice president. And we started having a discussion. I said, listen, I know you might not vote for me, here in the fall, uh, I can tell by the sign that's in your hand. Right. But if you go on my website and you check out my platform, there's this thing called the Voter Bill of Rights that's all about expanding democracy, expanding choice, making it where we can have more choices in the ballot, uh, fighting for things like proportional representation, all these things that dem Democrats right now are claiming they're, they're, they're fighting to preserve democracy. And so I said, no matter what happens on November the 5th, I want you to check this out and I want you to join me in the fight to pass the Voter Bill of Rights in as many states as possible, because if we do that, you know, we can see more choice of the ballot. And that person said, you know what, I'm gonna take your, let me take that card from you, I will take a look at your website today. That sounds really interesting. Now this person's probably not gonna vote for me, but what they are gonna do is they're actually gonna look at my website, they're gonna go through, they're gonna find the Voter Bill of Rights, but they might find some other policies that they like and that they agree with and say, hey, maybe why aren't we talking about this? Why aren't we doing that? And actually expanding the ideas. But there were a lot of voters who were just really dissatisfied with the two-party system. Right. There were a lot of voters who uh, don't feel like Donald Trump or Kamala Harris really represents them at all. And to those folks, we were getting great reception and you know, we got a lot of people committing to vote Libertarian this November, not just for me, but for uh, Florida candidates up and down the ballot. Uh, and you know, we have some amazing folks running here in the state. So I think it was a very productive day of meeting with voters. Uh, and I always enjoy that real tale politics. You know, you, you're meeting with people who are not necessarily 100% libertarian. And that is the general voting public. You know, if I only try to communicate to those who are 100% libertarians, we wouldn't get very far. Right. So uh, I think that's important to do. And it was a great event to do that. And uh, yep. thank you guys, uh, Duval County and, uh, and libertarians from across the state of Florida for coming out to River City Pride and manning the booth and uh, doing the good work that we need to do. Right, and, and just let me point out, when 
he says there was somebody there with a sign. That's just the one person that happened to be at our tent. There were many people there with uh, Harris Wall signs or shirts that said Harris Wall. It, oh, is, yeah. it was definitely a Democratic stronghold, but the Libertarians came out and we held our own. We had a lot of conversations. How many people do you suppose that you talked to or other people in our tent talked to? I mean, just, I mean, alone, uh, we were probably into the, definitely high into the double digits, if not into the triple digits of people we talked to. Like, I think individual conversations that I had with voters, I mean, I, Every time I'd have a conversation with somebody, I'd have like a two or three minute conversation and people would go, all right, thank you very much. I'm going to have a great day. I'm going to go continue Pride or whatever. Uh, I would go to sit back down in my lawn chair and Joe Hanush, God bless him, would be like, hey, Chase, we got someone else for you to talk with. So I'd be all right, get back, get back out of the chair. And so I was literally spending my day uh, talking to people, attempting to get back in the chair. And as soon right. as I had started that attempt, another person was there to talk to. Um, this is why I like retail politics. It's why I like doing the state fair circuits. We're going to be doing uh, at least one more of those left in North Carolina coming up. So it's important for us to hit those retail politics because not only do we get to express our values outward, but we also get to hear from voters across the spectrum about what's important to them. And if we're going to do the job of uh, presenting solutions to these folks, we need to know what solutions they're looking for, what concerns them and then express ourselves that way. You know, I've heard uh, from some folks saying, you know, uh, you, you focus too much on immigration, or you focus too much on this, or you focus too much on that. Well, the truth is, is I focus on what the voters want me to focus on. I look at what are the most important issues, and then I try to present those through the libertarian lens. And uh, those kinds of events, outreach at a pride or at a county fair or whatever, gives you that insight that we as candidates need in order to sell the message of liberty to as many people as possible. And so right. I encourage you, if you're a candidate out there running at any level, you need to find outreach events. You cannot do this online. You cannot do this without door knocking and getting to know your neighbors. And if there's an opportunity like a state fair or a festival where you're going to see hundreds or thousands of your community members walking through your potential voters, you seize on that opportunity. You take it, uh, even if it might be a left of center crowd that has a lot of Democrats there. You can't be afraid to walk in the lion's den and speak to a lot of people that might disagree with you uh, out in the public, which is why I've done, you know, when I do gun shows, for instance, let's just say there's probably a lot of people with Donald Trump hats on walking around right. with Make America Great Again hats. But we still push our message outward as libertarians at these gun shows because A, we're way better on the Second Amendment than Donald Trump is. But B, because we want people to know where we are and where we stand even if they're not gonna vote for us that day, they see us as a viable option in the future. So maybe that gun voter votes for Trump or Vance in 24, but maybe the Republican Party, when Trump tries to pass red flag laws if he gets elected or something to that effect, they go, wait, we gotta leave, we gotta go to that other party. I remember them at the gun show, they're the Libertarians, those are where I wanna go now. We have to be welcoming to people and we have to be willing to walk into rooms with people who are maybe majority Republicans or majority Democrats. If we only walk into rooms that are majority Libertarians, guess where we're going to be? Right. Libertarian conventions. Yep, <laughs> absolutely. All right, so let's talk about his campaign. So um, first question that I have here is um, how many states are you, are, are you and your running mate on the ballot for? So we're on the ballot in 47 states. Okay. Uh, the other remaining states in the District of Columbia, we are certified writing candidates. So if you can spell the name Chase Oliver, you can vote for me in every state across the country, even if my name is not listed on the ballot. Okay. Uh, and so we we worked very hard at shout out to folks like, uh, you know, shout out to folks like Bill Redpath and Ken Molman and uh, all those folks who went out and gathered signatures. You know, I was doing that in. Pennsylvania, even before I was the nominee, like mm -hmm. I was joking, I was like, hey, if I don't win, I'm gathering signatures for Mike Termod or for Lars Maps or for whoever, uh, but all in, you know, all in good faith to uh, spread the message. But yeah, it, it was a Herculean effort to get us in 47 states. So, so what happened to the other three states? Yeah, so the, the other three remaining, so uh, we'll go one by one. You got Illinois, New York, and Tennessee. Uh, Tennessee, I'll start with because they were the, 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 the lowest ballot threshold. Now, Tennessee has the lowest ballot access threshold in the country. Uh, normally, the state party just throws out a couple of volunteers and they get that very easily. Uh, this year, uh, we ended up having to hire petitioners because of a little bit of pushback there. And uh, they got over 500 signatures, uh, and you need 375. So it doesn't seem like a huge effort. Uh, but the state threw out over half those signatures. And so we tried to appeal. We tried to go to different counties and you know, question these things. Uh, unfortunately, that did not happen, so we went through the next process of becoming a write-in candidate, which required us to fill out a form for every county and city in the state of Tennessee. Oh, wow. That's how, 
That sounds like a lot of fun. Yeah. And then the other two states, you've got New York and you said Illinois. Illinois. Yeah. So Illinois, much the same way. Illinois has a very high ballot access threshold. And um, part of that is, is much of the signature gathering time is before you have a nominee, before most voters are paying attention to a lot of that stuff. And so uh, it presents a little bit of a difficulty when you have to explain the placeholder stuff and all that. Um, but they already just have a very high threshold and there's just not enough uh, resources to get that done uh, before the nomination and post nomination. We just were not able to play the catch up we needed to. Uh, and then New York. They just hate libertarian candidates. New York is the worst. <laughs> uh, New York basically after Larry Sharp had run for governor, they basically altered the ballot access uh, thresholds to really raise the number of signatures you needed and they cut the window down to six weeks. And one of those six weeks was during the week of our national convention when obviously many New York libertarians are actually participating in the convention. They're coming to do that work and so they're not on the ground getting signatures. And then I know good New Yorkers who wanted to come to convention but couldn't because they were trying to get us on the ballot uh, and it just didn't happen. And so these are hurdles that are put up by the state, by the way, that Democrats or Republicans, they don't have to go through these. Uh, they don't have to go through the expense uh, of getting on the ballot. And it's one of the things I'm fighting for as a candidate to retain or win ballot access in as many states so we don't have to go through these processes again in four years. Again, Herculean effort, so many volunteers, so many amazing people made this happen. I, I wish I could thank all of them individually. Uh, and then there, you know, uh, and so we're going to do what we can to spread that message, to maintain our ballot access at everywhere we can, so that way in 2028 it's not as Herculean of an effort. Got it. And so my next question then is, uh, before, if I understood correctly, before convention in May, where delegates voted to determine who would be our presidential nominee, you, uh, how you claim to be, I believe, the 50-state candidate. You had mm -hmm. visited all 50 states. How many states have you visited since? Uh, so we are definitely over, I mean, me and Mike together, we're at the over 25 level. I think there's a few smaller states we have not hit, uh, but we're trying to spread ourselves out as much as possible. Luckily, we're not Democrats and Republicans. We're only focusing on like six states. Right. Uh, and so just Mike alone, I think, has been, uh, you know, he just got done going through the Midwest of like Wisconsin, Michigan. He's been through Pennsylvania, Virginia, obviously his home states. Uh, me, I've been all through the South. Uh, through the West, like in terms of, I'm going to be heading to Phoenix soon. We just got back from uh, the Balloon Festival in Plano. We had actually toured all through that state. I mean, uh, we are trying to hit as many places as possible and, and recognizing that the window of time that we have compared to the window of time I was running for the nomination, which was quite a bit longer, uh, is a bit truncated. And so uh, I know there are states that I would love to have hit again. Uh, trust me, uh, I see Fina Benoan out there who's Florida Senate candidate right now, lived in Hawaii, and uh, there are members of my staff who are really upset that I'm not going back because I kind of promised that they could go with me if we went back to Hawaii. <laughs> uh, but no, but in all seriousness, we are hitting as so many So wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. You've already broken a campaign promise? Well, you know, uh, I don't make those promises, you know. So here's the thing. Uh, I'll give you a key insight into travel as a campaign. I don't pick where I go all the time. In fact, my schedule is built by a group of people who are determining where am I going to be most effective, where can we get the, the word out the most, and uh, how many places can we make Chase travel to as much as possible in as few days. So this is kind of a challenge that our campaign staff likes to put together. And uh, thanks to them and some awesome volunteers on the ground, uh, we're being as active as we possibly can be uh, in this race. How, how many more states do you think you'll make in the next 30 days before the election? Well, let's see. Just for me, I have North Carolina, Arizona. Um, I'm trying to think of if Mike is going to be hitting any new states or if he'll be kind of double dipping back in a few states. Uh, and then, of course, I'm going to be doing some extensive stuff through Georgia. Uh, being my home state, it's an easy drive to do that. And it's obviously where a lot of media and attention is right now, it being a big old swing state. Uh, so we're probably going to hit three or four more in the next 30 days, uh, at least just me, um, and Mike will probably be hitting a few more as well. Awesome. What's been the vibe when you get out to these different states and places and events and stuff like that? Because like you said earlier, you're not necessarily, I mean, you might be going to libertarian events or you might be going to non-libertarian events with libertarians, kind of like you did yesterday. Mm -hmm. Yesterday was not a libertarian event, um, but it was one that we sort of hosted because we had a table mm -hmm. um, at a larger event. So. What is the vibe that you're getting in all these different states when you talk to people? Are they like, you know, my, my experience a lot of times is like, oh, yeah, libertarians. I totally would vote for you guys, but I can't. And then they have some reason why they got to vote for whoever, whoever they're voting for, right? 
What's your vibe? What do you, what do you, what's the feel you're getting as the actual candidate? Well, you always get a fair amount of that, right? You get the two party voter who's like, hey, you guys are great, you're brilliant, you got the best ideas ever, but I just can't vote for you because I gotta vote for the guy that I think is gonna win. Um, that always happens. But what I've seen in this election is a lot of people who are willing to hear from the alternative, who are open to hearing from the alternative. In fact, they're excited to see the alternative. Sometimes you, know, you speak to voters a lot of time, they're like, oh, I had no idea anybody was running outside of Trump or Harris. You know, that, that voter that just starts paying attention after Labor Day, which is, you know, we're political junkies, we're paying attention all the time, right? But most American voters, they really only start keying in after Labor Day. And so uh, a lot of times when you're meeting folks, they're excited to hear from alternative. They're very tired of the two-party system. Mm -hmm. uh, and especially if you're in a deep red or deep blue state, it's very easy for me to sell on somebody. Like, listen, your vote is more impactful building a true comp uh, competition via the Libertarian Party in your state than retaining yourself as this deep red or deep blue state where you're a one-party system. If you actually jump outside, if you're in California, and instead of voting blue, you vote gold. Or if you're in if you're in uh, Texas, it's a deep red state. You vote you vote libertarian instead of voting Republican. What are you doing? You're helping to grow yourself from a one party state and potentially a three party state. And I think it's a better investment of your time, your vote, especially if you agree with us. If you're like, oh, I agree with X, Y, and Z, and they say, well, I can't vote for you because of this. I say, actually, you need to vote for us because of this. You need to help us build this true competitor in the system, especially if you live in a deep red or blue state, because you know if you're in a deep red state, the Democrats are never going to get their act together. If you live in a deep blue state, Republicans are going to be hopeless. So let's build up competition by eking away at those majority-based parties. Let's get as many uh, Democrats in California woke up to the fact that you know, democratic economics are terrible, and that there are far better ways to live than overtaxing and overregulating our government. If you live, if you're a Republican in a red state, make them realize that the Republican Party is really the party that is actually functioning for big corporate interests and not the mom and pop business. Even though they say they're for limited government, they're actually for parsing out favors to whoever pays them the most. So we need to wake up people in these red and blue states to reject this party binary, or even worse, a unit party, where there's just one party involved uh, in power. And, and so uh, I'm getting a lot of enthusiasm about that, especially once you explain to people like what the investment in this party really looks like. And so you're right. We get a lot of those people that initially say, I'd love to vote for you, but I can't because. And that's when I challenge them, actually, you need to vote for us because of this. What are some of the top topics that you hear about? Oh, well, the economy is always going to be number one, right? Uh, inflation, cost of living, like, hey, it's getting more expensive to buy food for and clothing for my kids, these kinds of things. Uh, that's always going to be the number one issue. And it's a winning issue for the Libertarian Party for two reasons. One, we're the only political party that's advocating for fighting back the greatest driver of inflation, which is debt and deficits. We're the only one that says, get our fiscal house in order so that we're not printing trillions of dollars and you're out of thin air devaluing your dollar. We're also the only only campaign in this race that truly supports free market principles. You know, you have the Jill Steins and the Cornell Wests and the Kamala Harris's on the left who have very left view on economics, very state control economics, and so do you from the Republicans. They're all about protectionism, they're all about state control over our economy, and right now the Libertarian Party is the only true free market party out there, and a study just came out showing like positives and negatives that people associate. The highest positive association across this country was for capitalism. Capitalism was at net, it was at plus 30. Socialism is at negative 30. Why can we not garner these votes? Why can we not break through these people that were the only free party uh, market party? That's the challenge that I think I have and candidates have across the country. Awesome. That's really great. Uh, so it sounds like things are going fairly well, um, as well as it could. You know, the Libertarian Party is the underdog. We do have the uphill battle. So. It's a battle that we have to continually get out there and fight. You heard about ballot access issues. Those are always a challenge. They have been challenges for decades upon decades for us. So, you know, if you're watching um, and for the folks in the audience here, you know, make sure that you stay active in your local party to help out because it's not just Chase that you're helping. When we fight hard for ballot access, it's for people like Fina Benoen, who is out in the audience right now, who's running for Senate. For Florida. It's for Joe Hunouche, who doesn't happen to be here today, and he's running for a state uh, level, uh, a state house role. Like libertarians running in all sorts of roles benefit from this ballot access. So, and they benefit from the hard work of the volunteers. So, do, do stay active. All right, let's, let's shift a little bit um, 
here and let's talk about some of the controversies that are out there in the public that people are talking about. So the first one, you mentioned to me prior to the show, you were like, look, and you said it on Twitter, uh, social media, you said, look, I've been out to Springfield. So I just got to ask you, how did the cat taste? Yeah, you know, no cat there, you know, ironically enough. And so what I actually saw, uh, and, and I wanted to go to Springfield because I knew once Trump brought that up during the debate, which was kind of brought on by internet rumor, I was like, okay, there's going to be an effect that happens because of this, because this is not, it's not normal for, your, you know, for a town to be called out during a presidential debate. And so I traveled there to see what the Haitian community was like there. Uh, you know, I got to eat Creole food. Um, I got to understand, you know, and listen to citizens of the town. I got to go to church in town and hear from parishioners there who are trying to do work to help folks assimilate uh, Haitians in terms of like teaching them English or, you know, providing them assistance. And they are traumatized by this. Like when I say, you know, uh, I go to church and you're hearing them talk about a woman who is trying to teach Haitians English and she's trying to do this as a charity to help people. And of course, the, the critics of immigration always say that assimilation is a, an issue that we need to worry about. Well, this is trying to solve that issue. It's trying to teach people the local language so they can better assimilate into the community. And for this, the day before I was there, I was there on a Sunday. That Saturday, they had like men with swastikas literally surrounding her place where she's trying to do this. And that traumatizes the community. And they don't deserve that because, and as, as one person in the city said to me when I'm talking, they said, are there logistical problems with the fact that we've had a huge influx of people? Yes, but we're trying to work through this as a city and as a community. And we're trying to recognize that these people, uh, these Haitian immigrants, are not here to do harm to us. They're here to escape really unescapable, you know, un unfathomable poverty, right? Like, if you've never seen, by the way, if you've never seen the conditions in Haiti, um, it, will, it will shake you to your core to see how tough it is for people to get along there. And so uh, the reason why I traveled there is because I wanted to understand what the dynamics were in the city. Uh, and what I'm seeing now is a city that is far more uh, affected by the rumor and conjecture that was brought to them by a presidential candidate saying this stuff on the national stage than they were by the impact of immigration in their city. And that they were able to properly work through the first on their own as a city figuring this stuff out. And now, because of this, all these external factors have come into their city and making things a lot, diff uh, a lot tougher. And what it has done is it's unified the people of the city to reject the outsiders, to say, don't be coming in here with your hate groups. Don't be coming in here saying these things that you don't know about uh, and assume that we're just gonna be cool with that. And so, you know, I shout out to the people of Springfield who had to go through that. And, you know, this is why as a presidential candidate, I try to get facts. And I don't try to listen to what's online. I try to find verifiable sources on the ground because if we're listening to rumor, you can cause a lot of trauma to communities that don't deserve it. I think we're seeing kind of the same situation out of the Carolinas and Tennessee and parts of Florida and Georgia right now in the wake of Helene. There's a lot of stuff coming out online that's not verified. And what that's doing is it's muddying the waters of legitimate information, especially when there's issues where, you know, there are issues where individuals are having problems with the federal government or state and local governments. Well, we want to help fight for that. As libertarians, we want to fight back against that. But if we don't know what's actually going on and we're just, there's all this room around, it makes it harder. So that's very interesting that you, you mention like the Carolinas and some of these other states um, because that's been controversial <laughs> as well. And you actually had a, a relatively controversial post. Um, they went, I don't want to say it went quite viral, but it did pick up a lot of momentum where um, you, you basically said like, hey, that's not what's going on. Uh, you know, with FEMA. And so, you know, and I defended that. I, I went and I did some research and I said, okay, you know what, it, it looks like what you're saying is accurate. Um, but a lot of your critics were like, hey, you know what, you're supporting FEMA or you're defending FEMA, you know, in some way. So tell me about this post. Tell me about, like, why you're not defending FEMA. Because yeah. we know that libertarians are against three-letter agencies, but it sounds like you know, maybe your critics think that you're cool with a four-letter agency. Well, I got a four-letter word for the government. Oh, uh, no. But the truth is, uh, you know, so FEMA, you know, we can argue philosophically as libertarians, and I think we can do it quite well, as to why FEMA is not the most efficient way to mandate resources in an emergency, that, that reallocating those resources back to state and local communities who know the impact on the ground, who can more quickly uh, address these issues, um, that's where that should lie. And I, I can argue that all day long. And it's really what I believe. As a libertarian, I do believe in the decentralization of power. And there's not, 
you know, and if there is a need to have some sort of federal response, we shouldn't have a whole agency that can do that. You can do that through the DOD using the National Guard and the military to assist, which we're seeing right now, Army Corps of Engineers, National Guard's been activated. You don't have to have a whole FEMA agency to address that at the federal level. That being said, FEMA exists now, and they are, however inefficiently and you know, not great, trying to do what they can. And I think when you say, oh, well, they're bankrupt because they gave all the money to illegals, when there's clearly a different funding stream, and you have to know how government works. If you want to tear down government, you need to know how it functions. You need to know exactly what, how money gets allocated to different agencies. And so when you see, you know, uh, yes, FEMA moved some money around from Border Patrol to help assist people and uh, and being relocated, that did happen, but it didn't come out of the disaster fund. Not that I think we need to have a disaster fund. Again, I think FEMA is completely inefficient. Right. So, and I don't remember the name of the other fund, but one of them is the disaster relief fund, the DRF, and the other one is I think it's SSP. SSP. And um, I can't remember what it is, uh, what the what the letters stand for at the present moment. Um, but what it does is it is specifically designated for migrants. And one of the points that I made was that. If you're concerned about the funding of either of those, and you should be, then you should be talking to your congressman because your congressman is who voted to determine that funding, uh, which went to the uh, the DHS. Yeah, and I can, and I again, I can argue that we don't even need a DHS. I can argue we don't need a FEMA. I can argue all these things, but when you're a person on the ground who's cut off from all of society. And you know, and you're hearing that FEMA is not going to help me because they're helping illegals. You're you have to understand. Whenever somebody's trying to make you outraged, all right, this is the first thing you need to look at. Who's benefiting from me being angry here? And I think in this case, a lot of this was politics being shot into this 30 days before an election, because they want to manipulate people into being angry when they vote. And I understand the political strategy of it, but what that's not doing is helping people on the ground. And there are a lot of good people helping people on the ground. Shout out to the, shout out the Cajun Navy. Shout out to all the folks who have been out there, and community members, doing the, doing the damn thing, right? Like, actually getting out there and helping people and not making it political. You know what you don't do when you're pulling somebody out of floodwaters? You don't ask them who they voted for. And you know what you do when you're getting pulled out of floodwaters? You're certainly not asking the guy on the boat who they support for president. You're just saying, thank God you're here to help. And when you're helping people, you're like, thank God I'm in the ability to help people, right? right? And so that is one of the things I don't like is politicizing disasters. Now, I will talk all about how FEMA is an inefficiently run organization and ought not to exist. But I'm not going to do that using false information. Because I believe if we are going to tear down government, we have to be straight with the American people. We cannot use rumor innuendo, half-truth to try to get this done. We have to be bold and be explaining exactly how these things are funded, exactly why it is not efficient, why it's robbing you of agency, why it's robbing you of efficiency, why it's robbing you of your value when the money is taken out of your pocket and brought to a centralized uh, government agency. Right? We can argue those things, but what we don't want to do is politicize this tragedy. Because let me tell you right now, it doesn't matter whether you're a Democrat, a Republican, a Libertarian, Independent, Green, what have you. If you are stranded on your roof, or you have not had power for over a week, or you are struggling to feed your kids, or get your kids medication that they need, it's not about politics anymore. It's about coming together and surviving. And as a candidate for president, I'm gonna do my best to lead by example, by looking for verifiable information of what's going on, on the ground, by shouting out those who are actually doing the real work and helping people, and by trying to make sure that I'm doing my best to keep misinformation out of the process. Because if I want to keep tearing down government, I have to be honest and know exactly how it's done and exactly the processes it takes to fund those governments. And so, yeah, let's fight to end FEMA. But also, let's not lie about what's going on in the process to do it. Because if we do that, we lose the trust of the American voter. And guess what doesn't end FEMA? Right. And um, I just want to point this out. There is always an abundance of verifiable information for which we can work with and criticize government. So it's not like, well, if we don't get upon this and jump on these half-truths, it's not like we're going to be short of anything to criticize government. No, no, there's plenty. Well, yeah. There is so much. And for me, I look at it and just say, as libertarians, as the underdog, uh, we should build the reputation that, man, those guys, they nail it every time. They are on top of it. They know their stuff. When we go to fact check them, they're right. 
That, to me, is the best reputation that libertarians can have. And that's one of the reasons why I jumped down on the post, because I was like, I, I, I looked at what people were saying, and then I spent literally like 20 minutes, for which prior to that 20 minutes, I had no clue. And after 20 minutes, I was like, wow. After reading, literally on FEMA's website, checking out some of their own sources because they put out their, their data and their details and they have reports that you can go through. Um, you know, Congress also has reports that you can go through. But, and I just skimmed them. Uh, I was able to identify and say, looks like a lot of people are misinformed. Let's inform people so that they can be angry at the right things. That way we can't be hoodwinked again, again, by government. Yeah, trust me, this is gonna be a long process, by the way. Uh, Carolina is, uh, you know, and, and you know, Western Carolina, East Tennessee, uh, much of Georgia and much of Florida, uh, you know, they are they are damaged in ways that is going to take months, if not years, to rebuild. Let me just say this to libertarians who are watching: we will have plenty of opportunities to crap all over FEMA and the terrible job they do. Trust me, because they're going to be on the ground for quite a while. We're going to be able to observe exactly what's going on. And I want transparency there. I think we need to be calling our elected officials, demanding transparency from FEMA as to how they're responding to this, exactly where the money is going. And if there are, and I, and I will say this, if you, if you are someone who is on the ground, who has firsthand information about your, whether it's FEMA, the state government, or local government that is impeding rescue efforts, if you, as an individual, have experienced this, please reach out to my campaign. Not a friend of a friend, or I saw an internet post about it, but if you know somebody, or you are somebody who has been affected by this, please reach out to my campaign. We want to hear these stories so we can let people know about them, so we can help form an opinion, and so we can help form information. So when we do start investigating FEMA in the process of this, which you know, any disaster of this size is eventually gonna start being investigated by people. We wanna have that best, first-hand, verifiable information that we can bring forward as libertarians to explain why FEMA is inefficient, why FEMA is making mistakes, and we can improve upon those in the process, hopefully one day getting ourselves to where we don't have a FEMA. But if we don't start getting the information now, we're going to have nothing to fight with. Right. All right, so let's shift to the next controversy. This is the last one that we will go through on the controversies, um, and then we'll shift to another topic. Um, well, let's talk about the ILA strike. Now, the ILA strike, the International Longshoremen's Association, their strike uh, started and ended. Now, I will point this out. Uh, I did my episode, episode number 386, which you can go back and you can watch if you want, where I discussed, I discussed primarily the, uh, the words and the things that were coming out in the media from their president, Harold Daggett. Um, I called him an economic terrorist. I hold true to that. Um, Chase may or may not agree. We don't know just yet. We'll find out. But I will say this. Either, it was either the day of, like I did that on my show in the morning, and either that night or the very next day that their strike ended. So you're welcome, America. I'm just <laughs> saying. You know, I know my podcast is small, but it's mighty. So tell me a little bit, because you are in the ship, or you were in the shipping industry. Yeah, so I worked for a maritime shipper. So I worked for a company that helped to move goods on containers uh, from port to port all the time. And of course, Longshore and the people who are taking those containers off of our ships. Um, it's a, it's kind of a nuanced thing, right? Like, uh, I, I think Daggett, of course, is playing a very heavy hand, and I don't think he's probably the best representative of a, a union. First off, if you're going to be a union rep, please, like, take off your gold chain and your very expensive glasses. And all these right. Like, you're not really representing the average working man very well when you come across that way. Uh, but longshoremen, they do a very difficult job. Uh, and I think, you know, what you're seeing here from the East Coast and the Gulf is they're wanting their pay to line up with the West Coast. Now, the West Coast does get paid quite a bit more. Uh, uh, they're longshoremen. But of course, on the West Coast, cost of living is quite a bit greater in most places, not maybe New York and Philadelphia, but look at Charleston or Savannah or some of these Gulf ports. The cost of living to live there is far less. Uh, the other thing they're pushing back against is automation, which, you know, uh, I understand the impulse to do that. But uh, if you look at the efficiency of our ports in the United States, we're among the lowest efficient uh, around the world. And it's because we have the least automation. So I think there are, you know, it, it, in my experience, this is what's probably going to happen on January 15th when they come to an agreement. There's probably going to be pay increases, and there's probably going to be some level of automation coming. Uh, I think they're going to meet in the middle there. Instead of a 72% pay increase, you're going to get something like 60%. Uh, instead of no automation, you're going to get some automation. But here's one thing that I think that not a lot of people have thought about that could allow for more automation to come in increasing efficiency, allow you to keep paying your workers well, and also not lose a whole lot of jobs in the process of that automation coming in. 
make our ports 24-7. A lot of our ports are not 24-7. Nearly every nation, like East Asia, Western Europe, Latin America, their ports are open 24 hours a day. And that allows for greater efficiency because they're pulling containers all day long off of there and they're moving them out on trains and trucks. We, because of the unions, have forced ourselves into a lot of these to have 16-hour port days. We're losing an entire eight hours of efficiency. So I say, why not fight for more 24-hour ports? You don't lose any jobs, you just shift some of those jobs over to third shift. You still pay your workers what you want to pay them, but you bring in automation so we can get things off more quickly and efficiently. Now, is that going to happen in January 15th? Probably not because it makes too much damn sense, right? right. But what I can tell you is, is automation is coming. There's no stopping it uh, because eventually we're going to get to a breaking point of where the cost of shipping gets to, you know, basically, here's why it hasn't come. Because it's, the cost of it is built into everything. Because everything is shipped. And so whether it's agricultural products or home goods or uh, products to build computers with or to assemble cars with, whatever it is that's coming on those containers, that excess cost of the labor and the lack of efficiency is just spread amongst everything. And eventually, that's, it is contributing to inflation. Our inefficiency at the ports is helping to contribute to inflation. Supply chain does this. And so ultimately, um, we're going to see more port automation. It's going to happen. And I know the union is going to be kicking and screaming into that. But again, I think there are solutions that could exist out there that could allow you to not have to fire a lot of workers, but bring that automation in and help the American business be more efficient and have to not have those costs passed on to us, the consumer. Because every one of those costs gets passed on to us. The cost of shipping gets passed on to you, the consumer, when you buy the thing. So if you're importing apples from somewhere, right, and you go buy that apple, the cost of that shipping that apple has been built into that, or a t-shirt from Vietnam. But here's one of the most important things that I think, and in the response to this, you heard kind of protectionists going, ah, well, we don't need shipping. We'll just build it here in the United States. Sounds good, but when you realize many of the things we build in the United States are built using components that import from other parts of the world. And so without that supply chain still moving, American businesses would not still move. We have to have shipping. We have to have commerce. Uh, and uh, it is something that, you know, maybe because I have experience in the industry, I'm a hardcore free marketer, um, but I want to tear down those protectionist uh, trade barriers that are also being passed on to you, the consumer. Every step of the way, the supply chain, and it employs Americans too. That's the other thing I hear is, well, screw them, they don't, you know, they're importing everything, that doesn't make American jobs. That container comes off a ship, it's taken off by a longshoreman, moved onto a train that's conducted by Americans and then taken off of that train onto a truck that's driven by an American to a warehouse that's worked by Americans and then put onto another truck that goes to the Walmart that's worked by Americans and then you as an American buy that t-shirt that originally came from Vietnam. There is a lot of American jobs built into the supply chain and if we can create efficiency at the ports, we can create less cost in the trucking and the railroad side of things as well and ultimately make things cheaper for Americans. So I empathize with longshoremen <laughs> but I recognize that your industry is changing. And maybe instead of fighting against automation, then you should be fighting to allow for early retirement for some of their older longshoremen whose jobs would be disappearing through automation or fighting for increased training opportunities to help retrain their younger workers into a new industry that is not about to be automated away the way shipping is. These are all options we can take. These are all are options on the table. Let me tell you this, you know who should absolutely not be making any of these decisions? Joe Biden or whoever the President of the United States is after uh, January the 20th, 2025. Absolutely not. They should not be in voting Taft-Hartley. This needs to be done between the union and between the port operators and the, and the uh, maritime carriers. Those are the people who have to negotiate these things. If we get the government involved, let me just tell you, let me just, prediction, it'll be screwed up. So uh, that's all I can say as a presidential candidate who worked in the industry, right. that if I'm elected president, I'm not doing anything about it. All right, awesome. <laughs> so. We're going to shift to this next part, part which I am calling the, um, uh, I'm, I'm labeling this section the insider baseball. Now, we're not going to get too insider, but if you've been on social media for a while, you've seen that Chase is, has gotten a lot of criticism about some things. And so what I wanted to do is kind of address some of the things that haven't been talked about to death. So some of the things that were talked about over and over and over, I'm not interested in. But I am kind of interested in, a while back, it came out that you were invited to come and be on Tim Pool's podcast. And anybody that knows t who Tim Pool is, he has a phenomenally large podcast, okay? It's very successful. Good for him. 
I'm happy for him. Phenomenally right? large does sound like a Donald Trump thing. Phenomenally large. Right, right. So, but he's got, he does, he has, he has a very, he has a very large podcast, like I think millions of viewers or something like that. And you were invited on, as was uh, one of our other very interesting and entertaining libertarians up in New Hampshire, Jeremy Kaufman. Those are, and, those are certainly adjectives. And you, you declined. So I want to, I want to know, um, before you answer, I'll, I'll, I want to say one more thing. I want to know why you did not go on the podcast. And I will say this: I was a relative. I was a bit of a critic because I said, "Look, I think that our presidential candidate should go on as many large platforms as possible because I think that's just a good thing to do in general. And if you can do it and you can get invited on, then you should go." Right now, sometimes they will be hostile. And in this particular case, I do believe that it was going to be hostile and the intent was probably to be hostile. I don't think it was going to be an event like today where it's a little bit more friendly and he can actually sit close to me, you know, because we're not like, you know, at each other's throats. So tell me, tell me why you didn't go on Mr. Poole's podcast. So first off, I think it's important to note that I was not going on Tim Pool's, uh, what is it, uh, what is it, Tim Pool podcast, his main podcast. IRL, IRL. or something. Yep. I wasn't invited to go on that podcast. I was invited to go on a podcast called Culture War, uh, to where I would be sitting across the table from, uh, you described him as, uh, uh, in the words you turn, I would say, loathsome individual Jeremy Coffin. Uh, I find him to be somebody who actually pushes actively people away from the Libertarian Party. He's happy to say he does that. He encourages everyone to vote Republican. So uh, I don't think it was going to be very valuable to spend my time having to argue race science and all sorts of nonsense with somebody who is, frankly to me, full of BS about a lot of those topics. I think it would have been more valuable for me to continue to be a candidate for president to talk about the issues that most voters care about. Uh, I'm not going to go sit on a podcast to be called a gay race communist for an hour by somebody who's ranting and raving. Now, that being said, I would love to have sit with Tim Pool the way he did with Robert Kennedy and the, day we, the way he did with Donald Trump in a one-on-one -on -one interview. Happy to do it. I would love to do it. In fact, I think we could have a great conversation, but I'm not going to go I think we are. Yeah. Well, yes, you with your beanie. You channeling Tim Pool right now, right? You don't have a skate park in West Virginia, but we'll forgive that. No, but the, the point is, is we were having a one-on-one -on -one discussion the way Donald Trump, the way Robert Kennedy Jr. had been invited on to the podcast. I would have hopped on that in a minute. And of course, there's 30 days left in the election, right? But I'm not going to hop on a podcast that's specifically meant to divide libertarians, to crap on libertarians and say you should be voting for the Republican anyway. I'm not going to do that because, frankly, it's not worth the it's not worth the bandwidth to have to argue with Jeremy Coffin online. And that's how I feel about it. Okay. Sounds like the audience agrees, and that's fair. So um, I got another prop here, and um, so let me let me add my other prop. And this is just a, a nice little coat here, and I'm going to do the best that I can to, uh, to look like another individual, actually an individual that I highly respect. So I'm, I'm, cool, with Tim, uh, I'm cool with Tim Pool doing his thing. I have no beef with him. Um, this other individual, I actually am, I would consider a friend, and I enjoy. And after the whole Tim Pool thing, am I still, is my audio still working? Okay, making sure. Um, after the whole Tim Pool thing, uh, comic Dave Smith, that's how he goes online, Dave Smith, uh, very popular comedian, um, a very popular libertarian who's also a comedian, and I think he's popular as a comedian as well. Um, he invited you on the show, and he said, look, I'll, give it, I'll, I'll be fair to you, and it would have been, just like you said, a one-on-one. -on -one. And that one, even more than the Tim Pool, I agreed that you should be on, and as far as I know, you didn't go on, so tell me what happened there. Um, I would be willing to go on and talk to Dave. I don't know uh, exactly how that process went through. Uh, you know, there's a, we can go right now and you can book me for media on my website. Uh, that being said, you know, he's also indicated that he is not inclined to support me or vote for me, and that's fine. I talked to a lot of media that isn't going to be voting for me in the right. fall. Right. Uh, and so I have no problem talking to Dave. I've met Dave backstage at different events, uh, and I'm certainly not afraid to speak with Dave Smith. Uh, but what I do want to see is, is like, you know, is this going to be helpful to the campaign? Absolutely. If it is, I'm not opposed to it. Uh, just got to email our media team. Like, that's all literally anybody has to do to book me on, by the way. That's probably what you, I mean, you don't need to have to do that. You just have to know me. But uh, 
Well, no, we went through the we went through the process oh, here. Oh, see, so you yeah, email so, the media team, and that's how it works. Like, yep, that's email how it started. Media votechaseoliver.com, and you can get me booked on just about anything. Uh, and so that's kind of how I feel about that. I have no onus against Dave. In fact, uh, I think the last time we kind of had an extended conversation was in New Jersey not too long ago because I was doing a debate uh, with Josh Smith and Michael Rechtenwald up in there in New Jersey. And a great time conversing with them uh, backstage. Okay, so let me push back a little bit and see if. It, um, so you're saying Dave Smith needs to go and fill out a form and do the process. Um, he put it out there publicly. Um, and since you know I'm talking to you, is that something that you would even be willing to just reach out and say, hey, is that opportunity still available? I talked to Liberty Dad. He convinced me that I really need to do this, and let's just skip the, the formalities of this, and can we still make this hey, happen? Hey, if Dave thinks it's gonna be good for the campaign, he's more than happy to reach out. Like, I am you know, happy to talk to him if he wants to talk, but yeah, that's just the nature of it. I'll be on your podcast if you want, bro, but like, just book me. Because I don't, again, I don't make my travel, I don't make my schedule anymore. I don't decide when and where I'm gonna be a lot of the time, because we have a huge campaign apparatus that has to get me to a bunch of different places. And so I can't just say, hey, I'm going to be on the show at this time at this date. I've tried that running for president with other people. And nine times out of ten, I end up screwing myself because I end up conflicting with my own, uh, with my own uh, calendar. And so, yeah, email our team. I'll go on the show. I have no problem with it. Um, I do think, you know, as long as he's willing to be fair, I can argue my libertarian positions with just about anybody. I've sat in front of, I mean, I've debated Jill Stein, for Christ's sakes. I think there's enough differences between me and Jill Stein to say there's probably more differences between me and her than uh, me and Dave Smith. So, okay, yeah. fair enough. All right, um, I, this, this is a general question here, because you're on my podcast now. Yeah. So how many other libertarian podcasts have you been on? Uh, I've been on quite a few, though uh, a lot of times the majority of the media we're doing is outward facing. Because I think a lot of libertarians already know the libertarian candidate, especially, uh, you know, uh, certain shows like are very much geared to the big L libertarian audience, the people who are already at convention. Like, uh, is there more value in doing that show or a show, say, like Forbes that gets tens of thousands of viewers who maybe haven't heard the libertarian at all this cycle? And so when you're looking at where the most effective media is, sometimes it's libertarian podcasts, which I did a ton in the lead up to the convention because who are you running when you're running for the Libertarian nomination? You're running with Libertarians. You want to get your name out with Libertarians. But after nomination, uh, a lot of times you end up focusing on shows that are across the spectrum. But um, I don't know. I, I've done, at this point, dozens and dozens of podcasts. I couldn't. And of course, what is a Libertarian podcast? Is it a person with a Libertarian point of view? Is it a person with a big old Libertarian host? Is it hosted by a Libertarian party affiliate? Um, I've done all of those. Uh, so yeah, I'm pretty busy all the time trying to speak to as many people as possible. Uh, there are some libertarians who maybe don't want me on the show. I don't know. Okay, so uh, basically what I'm hearing is uh, I, while I managed to get that live audience, still got to work on the exclusive. Let's go to audience questions now. So is there anybody in the audience that's like, man, I got a burning question. Yes, Mr. Willie, and I will repeat the question so in case it doesn't get picked up by the mic. I'll try to speak loud. <clears throat> um, so Interesting, you mentioned Haiti earlier. I, I spent three months with the Navy in Haiti in 1999. And uh, my experience there is really what led me to looking for a, another option. And uh, during, at the convention, I, I was voted for you every single round uh, because in talking to you several times, I learned that you were, you came from the anti-war community, the movement. Mm -hmm. And so uh, it was really important for me that we nominate an anti-war candidate, of uh, somebody that was actively anti-war, not just we don't start new wars. Oh, so yeah. um, if I could just, uh, if you could talk about that a little bit, that's something that hasn't been covered yet. But the, the anti-war, uh, where you stand there. Yeah, so... Uh, so before you... Yeah. The, que the, the, the question was, hey, you know what? I had experience in Haiti with the Navy. That shaped a lot of... That influenced me in a large part. And then another 
um, influence uh, was being anti-war, which is why uh, Mr. Willie, who asked, uh, you know, like, hey, can you expand upon your anti-war position because that's really important to me and led me to support you um, through every round while at the convention in D.C. So yeah. go ahead. So, uh, yeah, so if anybody knows any of my biography, I got started in politics even before I was a libertarian being an anti-war protester uh, because 9-11 um, happened when I was in school and I saw people that I went to school with going to fight in these wars in the war on terriers, particularly the war in Iraq, which... Uh, to me and to a lot of Americans, and now really to everybody, it looked like the intelligence agencies were manipulating uh, and cherry-picking intelligence to create this case for war when there really wasn't one. And that outraged me. Uh, but um, at the time, I didn't know about the Libertarian Party. And so George Bush was the evil war criminal in chief. And so I was like, if he's a Republican, I guess I'm a Democrat. And so I rolled with the Democrats for a while until they elected their own war criminal in chief, Barack Obama. And when they did that, and he didn't follow through on any of his anti-war promises, I said, I'm not going to be in the party led by a war criminal. And so I left the Democratic Party. Um, and that is really what has always shaped my uh, political worldview, is that if we are truly the leader of the free world, which is the moniker that is put on the United States all the time, then why are we not the leader of a peaceful world? Why are we not leading the world towards peace, and instead we're leading the world towards more war? Why are we not looking at solutions that create less violence in the world, but instead creating entire industries and the military industrial complex that functions and, and, and profits off of death and misery around the world? Why are we like this? And that's been the core of my political philosophy my entire life, is, is why do we have to export our values with, with, with bullets and bombs? Like, what, what is it about us? And when you realize that it's done because there's an entire military industrial complex that benefits off of it. There's an entire group of board members and, and millionaires and frankly billionaires who make money off of sending us to go fight in wars or sending our weapons overseas so that regimes can fight those wars. And it outrages me. It is why I believe the Libertarian Party is the political party for me because they're the only true non-interventionist foreign policy that says the only way we should be engaging with our neighbors is through free trade and voluntary exchange with them and direct diplomacy. And we only need to fight a war when our sovereignty is threatened. When someone is attacking us, we attack back. And let me tell you right now, if anyone attacks the United States, may God have mercy on their soul. But absent that, we should not be fighting anyone. And that includes exporting our wars around the world via Ukraine, via Israel and Gaza, be it Syria, be it anywhere else where we're putting money into war zones, that is us exporting our values with violence. And as Americans, I think we should be rightfully outraged that our foreign policy is rooted in the murder and misery and malice against other people. And for me, there can be no other reason better to fight on the national platform, to fight as a candidate for president. And so uh, I'm, I'm glad you asked me the question about a little bit about those views because I want to remove our military footprint from every continent around the world. We should not have military bases everywhere around the world. And when say, people say, well, that'll make it harder for us to maintain a stranglehold on the, on the national security apparatus of the world, well, you know what? Good. Maybe we need to work together with people instead of telling people what to do. But when talking about military readiness, we have these things called aircraft carrier groups. Let me tell you right now, one aircraft carrier group could, take, you know, could bring hell to about just any army that there is. So we're, pretty, we're pretty stacked military. I don't know if you've noticed but it's our largest discretionary budget item. We could cut our Pentagon in half and still be completely ready to fight a war if we needed to fight one. But I think we as libertarians and we as American voters, and I'm trying to bring the message out there as much as possible, that if we want to live in peace, we need to be allowing other people to live in peace. And that includes stopping selling weapons to Saudi Arabia to murder innocent Yemeni. That means uh, stop continuing to put military bases in and around areas of conflict that increase tension like we're seeing with Iran and Lebanon and Syria right now. We need to disengage from these things because if we're truly going to be the leader of the free world, we need to be the leader of a peaceful world. And uh, so as a candidate for president, that's the message I'm putting forward. And lo and behold, I'm the only candidate for president that's really pushing that message as hard as we are because it's part of our political philosophy of non-aggression and that's to the root of our party. And it's why I'm proud to be a libertarian. It's because we are the anti-war party. And I'm anti-war to the core, and I encourage folks who are watching this out there to join in the movement to be anti-war. Uh, and, uh, and this includes everybody. By the way, everybody uh, who is engaging in warfare in one way or another pretty much is a war criminal. Every 
you know, I can call Putin a war criminal, I can call uh, Netanyahu, I can call Hamas, I can call Hezbollah, I can call, frankly, uh, the conscription that's happening in Ukraine to me is a war crime. Uh, you know, I can say that, uh, you know, our own government has been war criminals my entire life. I'm not afraid to call it out. I'm not afraid to expose it for what it is. And again, I don't condemn people for the actions of their government. Because if I condemned the Israeli people for the actions of the Netanyahu government, I would then have to condemn our own people for the actions of our government. And we have a lot more sins on us uh, as a nation than many do around the world. And so we have to keep that in mind. When we're fighting to be anti-war, we're not anti-Israeli, we're not anti-Palestinian, we're not anti-Ukrainian, we're not anti-Russian. We are anti-Russian government. We are anti, you know, we are anti all the governments of those people, but not the people. And let's keep that in mind as we fight against war. And thank you for the question. All right. Are there any other questions out there? Make Chase rant. All right. I would like to know your ideas, positions regarding taxation. Uh, okay. So the question was, what are your ideas regarding taxation? And let's hope this is a short one. Uh, it's theft. <laughs> right? I can just say it that way. Uh, but what would I want to do as president to reduce the impact of taxation on our lives? Uh, cut government down to size. Frankly, um, we need to balance our budget immediately because if we don't, any cuts that we do make to taxes are going to hit us back in the butt with inflation because of the debt and deficit spending. And so first, if we want to cut taxes, we have to cut spending. We have to be realistic about that. Uh, and get ourselves to a balanced budget. From there, you continue to cut government so you can continue to cut taxation. What you do on the corporate side and the personal income side is remove all deductions, all carve-outs, all subsidy, and you just straight up flatten the tax code. Uh, if you do this, you're going to create a more competitive environment in the corporate environment so more businesses can get created, compete in the marketplace, grow to becoming a small business and becoming a large business. All about you, but you pair that with not bailing out a big business when they fail, you let them fail, you let their resources be reallocated in the marketplace. Uh, and when you reduce the impact of taxation on you as an individual with your income tax, uh, on the way to eliminating it, ideally, uh, you're allowing you to have more money in your pocket to be able to feed your family, pay for your rent, uh, buy a car, start a business, whatever it is you want to do with your own life. When we remove the, uh, the barrier of, impact, uh, of income tax in your life, we remove those barriers, we create more agency for you as an individual to live your life as you see fit in a peaceful manner, and that's ultimately what we want. And so, yes, taxation is theft, and we need to start removing that theft from our pockets as much as possible, as quickly as possible, while also reducing government, because if, again, if we just cut taxes and we don't cut the spending, we're actually creating a backdoor tax call that's an inflation. And it's an insidious tax that requires no congressperson to vote for it. Uh, it just happens because we print trillions of dollars out of thin air. And so if we want to cut taxes, we must cut spending. And this is the thing that Democrats and Republicans do not say. Donald Trump, I'm going to give you great, wonderful tax cuts. And you have Kamala Harris being like, oh, I'm going to give you this, I'm going to give you that, and we're going to do this, we're going to do that. But none of it comes with cutting spending elsewhere. It all comes from increased debt and deficit spending, and that is going to hit your wallet and your pocketbook, whether it's in your business or in your own personal bank account. And so if we want to cut taxes, which all libertarians should want to do because it's theft, then we have to cut the spending first because otherwise we create those backdoor taxes. So that's my policy on it. Cut it as much as possible, but you have to cut the spending to correlate. All right, awesome. By the way, I just want to point out that your Trump impression was just a slightly bit better than your Harris one. So, <laughs> you know, you might want to work on that a little bit. That he's, get, he's getting there. He's getting there. That, right, I think we had another question out in the crowd. Somebody, I thought I saw a second hand. Uh, yes. All right, uh, Fina Benoin here, longtime libertarian, three time candidate. Uh, just got a question for the future president of the United States of America. Um, under an Oliver administration, what kind of red flag laws and infringements of the Second Amendment would you be open to signing? All right, so the question from our, uh, our Senate candidate here in Florida, Finia Bonoan, is what kind of red flag laws would you be open to signing should Congress pass them and send them to your desk when you get elected? Uh, that would be zero. None. Uh, I am... As much as I'm anti-war, I'm also pro-Second Amendment. I'm uh, 2A all day, ladies and gentlemen. I think that you should be able to defend yourself as you see fit. And red flag laws violate due process. Are there instances where you might need to say somebody's very you know, dangerous in a dangerous society? Yeah, if you think that's the case, then get a warrant. Go through a court process. Like, actually 
you know, go through due process. But what red flag laws are absolutely, completely violating people's individual liberties based on hearsay or what someone says about you, and that can have your guns being taken away. And you know, I, I you know, if you really want to curb gun violence in this country, we need to recognize what are the factors that create gun violence. First off, gun violence is at near historic lows, ladies and gentlemen. We're not in some sort of crazy crime spree. As much as Donald Trump would like to make you think that, as much as the Democrats would like to make you think everybody's rooting and tooting and shooting everywhere, it's a lot less than it used to be. You're much more likely to be mugged at gunpoint uh, in the year I was born, 1985, when Donald Trump was 39, than in the year 2024 when I'm 39. Like, let's be realistic about this. And so it's not about stopping crime. It's about removing agency for people to protect themselves. And so, no, I will not support red flag laws. No, I will not support pistol brace bans or bump stock bans or suppressor bans or assault rifle bans. None of those things are going to make our country safer and make our country better. What they are going to do is disarm ourselves so that we are more subject to the tyranny of government and more helpless when danger comes to our door, especially if you're a rural landowner, if you're somebody who lives very far away from the police. When danger comes to your door, it's not even about minutes, it's about a half hour before the police will get out there. You should be able to protect yourself. And uh, I say that for each and every American, uh, you have that right. It's not even a constitutional right, which it is in the Second Amendment. It's an inherent human right to be able to protect yourself the, the arms, and if the government can have the gun, you should be able to have the gun. That is my position. And I say that as somebody who does not support nuclear proliferation, so no, I don't think you should be having a nuclear bomb in your backyard, but again, I don't think the government should have nuclear bombs either. But if you want to have a tank, have a tank. If you want to have a plane, have a plane. If you want a machine gun, have a machine gun. Just don't use it to hurt other people. That's the only deal we make with you. And as long as you can agree to that, I don't care what gun you have. Use it to protect yourself. So yeah, there would be no red flag laws in an Oliver administration at all. And you know who you're not going to get that from? Donald Trump, Kamala Harris. We're the only true Second Amendment party left. We're the only true Second Amendment party. We're the only true anti-war party. And we're the only true free market party. There is no reason to not vote for libertarians. All right. Any final questions there? All right. We've got a couple hands up. Uh, way in the back there. Yes, sir. Um, I know you advocate for decriminalization of abortion, but at what point do you not advocate? Like, how late? So okay, hold on. The oh, yeah, question, yeah, yeah. the question, because he's way not back there. Contra not controversial. At uh, all. The, the the question was, okay, at what point would you or do you support the decriminalization of abortion? Is that right? Like, at what point would you consider it a criminal offense to get an abortion? Oh, okay. Yeah. So, okay. at what point does it become a criminal offense to get an abortion for you? So, I am uh, I am pro-choice, and I do believe in the standards that are set by Roe and Casey as precedent. Uh, I recognize that there are people on good sides. Of both of this issue. There are pro-life people out there who are ardently pro-life, uh, and I will talk about them in just a moment. But personally for me, I support uh, the right of abortion up to the point of what's called viability. Viability is right now, uh, the, the KC and Roe standard is 26 weeks. Post 26 weeks, which uh, if you're needing an abortion, it's less than 1% of people who do, that would need to have a doctor sign off on the health or life of the mother uh, because someone's life is at risk at that point. Uh, but absent that, I do believe the point of viability is where there is a cutoff from that. Uh, and so I'm somebody who, because I believe in the body autonomy of women, I don't want to make that decision for them, uh, keeping that between a woman's privacy, her own health, and her doctor. Now let me speak to the pro-life community out there, of which I'm sure there are a few people maybe here who are members of that community. Um, I empathize with you. I understand your concerns. I understand where you're coming from, and it's from a place of true consideration. It's, it's not something that you've come to willy-nilly. Um, I, I extend to you the olive branch that as a pro-choice person, there are a lot of things we can do together to lower the instances of abortion ever being needed or ever being provided. Things like making birth control over the counter so more people have access to contraception so there's never an unwanted pregnancy to begin with. Uh, reduce the barriers around adoption and the red tape around adoption because right now it's very costly to become an adoptive parent and if more people were willing to become adoptive parents, more people who get pregnant would be willing to become a surrogate. Uh, and of course, uh, in decentralizing education, I as an individual, and if I were a parent, would be emphasizing proper sex education so my kids know the... The, 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 uh, um, the birds know. and the bees? All that stuff, yes. Thank you. Birds and the bees is a great way to put it. Uh, I'm a dad. Yeah. It's my job. And so, uh, Liberty Dad Pod, exactly. And so, I think it's important for us to have education uh, in whatever way you deem fit as a parent, but also reducing these barriers so that way there's less unwanted pregnancies to begin with. But absent that, I'm going to err on the side of bodily autonomy and respecting individual consideration. And considering I am somebody who does not have a uterus, will never undergo pregnancy or the 
uh, the potential medical complications that pregnancy can bring to you. It's not a decision as an individual I'm comfortable making for other individuals. I think we had uh, Mr. Ricardo, yeah. yes. Uh, you mentioned government spending cuts. What would be your list of priorities in terms of types of departments, uh, activities, et cetera, uh, in, in, in order of, uh, of whichever one should be going first, second, third, mm -hmm. second? Okay, so the question uh, for the camera and just as a reiteration for the crowd, um, regarding budget cuts, what is your priority, say, like first, second, third? Yeah, so uh, there's two things to look at. There's discretionary spending and there's non-discretionary spending. The discretionary spending side, obviously, the Pentagon is the area where there's the most room to cut because it's the largest individual, uh, you know, individual allocation uh, as far as discretionary spending. So I say you probably, again, cut the Pentagon in half. And you still wouldn't lose military readiness, but there are a whole other departments that I think need to go. The Department of Education needs to go and be blocked and ran it back to the states wholeheartedly. And you don't need to have a Department of Education. We've only had it since Jimmy Carter. We've put billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions and billions of dollars into that. And we have not seen the corresponding increasing in reading and writing and other things. So we can block grant that back to the states and let the states handle education. Uh, Department of Homeland Security. Much of what the DHS does today could be completely wiped away. Things like, uh, you know, organizations like the TSA that are completely inefficient. ICE, which we did not have before 2001, though we did have Border Patrol before 2001. We don't need to have all these extra organizations. And much of what DHS could actually be folded into the DOJ or the DOD if there is vital functions for them to be doing. Like I mentioned earlier, we don't need a FEMA, but if there is a need for a national response for disaster, we can do that through the DOD, through the military, uh, uh, the Army Corps of Engineers, and our National Guard. We don't have to have a separate byline organization that's taking billions and billions of dollars of money or trillions of dollars of money uh, over periods of time. So, uh, you know, after that, it's about what are we doing with the non-discretionary spending, namely Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, because that's actually the largest driver of our budget. Uh, and I have a Social Security plan that allows people who are living on a fixed income today to continue to live on that fixed income while we transition ourselves away from a program where younger workers like myself are no longer paying into Social Security because we need to be able to pay into our own retirement because we're not going to get anything out of Social Security because it is a Ponzi scheme. But again, my parents, they live on a fixed income. And if we all of a sudden flip that switch off, as a millennial, I don't think I'd be able to just take care of them overnight. So we need to allow them to continue to retire on the benefits they've paid into their entire life, recognizing those benefits are inefficient, they're not the best way to allocate resources, and do something better for younger generations. We have to transition ourselves away from a, uh, from a fully public social security system into a privatized retirement account. That's what needs to be done. And once we do that in a generation, we're moving trillions of dollars of spending out of the, uh, off of the thing. As far as Medicare and Medicaid, that is a different story because Medicare and Medicaid is like a rope that has a thousand knots tied in it. And you have to start untying knot, knot by knot, piece by piece of all the bureaucracy, all the regulation that is involved through Medicare and Medicaid in a process towards moving ourselves more to free market health care. Uh, but that, again, will never happen. You'll never, you will never ever pass a just get rid of Medicare bill. That will never pass the United States Congress. But if you can start removing and untying each of those knots, you can move ourselves more to a free market system to provide medical care for those who uh, are elderly or disabled or in need of Medicare, Medicaid services today. Let's transition ourselves over to an economy that focuses on mutual and direct aid so we can help those people out of our own pockets, out of our own community resources, and not have to rely on a federal government to do it. But again, that is the more complicated of the two. Social Security, we have a fully, a great plan that could be enacted through legislation quite quickly. Medicare and Medicaid, because of the complexity of the system, requires us to go piecemeal through it towards eliminating it. Uh, and so as if I were President of the United States, those would be the priorities that I would have in that order to try to eliminate both discretionary and non-discretionary spending we don't need. And thank you for the question. All right. Yes, sir. So two questions for you. One, a fun question. Um, who do you believe will win the national championship in college football this year? University of Tennessee, baby. That's who's going to win the national championship. Balls all day long. Rocky Top. I know that's very popular in Florida. <laughs> so, yeah. Listen, our Florida teams are nowhere close to national championship <laughs> right now. Uh, so the second question, the youngest among us, uh, it seems to be a huge milestone or a huge barrier to get to that home ownership. Um, we've taken a lot of free market principles out of uh, the workplace, and we're seeing our children, our grandchildren, that, that buying a home is going to be very difficult for them. How do you, as president, with the free market, get it so we can make the American dream possible for the youngest amongst us. 
All right, so the question, just to make sure it's on video, is as president, how can you ensure that the youngest among us have access to the American dream that is home ownership? Yeah. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, a very good question. And it's one that I hear all the time is, is you know, that, that ability to buy a home is out of reach for me. And that used to be the marker of the American dream for my parents, and it isn't for us today. Uh, much of that has to do um, with the fact that we cannot get starter homes built. That most of these homes that are being built today are very large, single-family homes that have a very high start price. Uh, and that's great if you're, if you're in the position to do that. But many of these starter homes are not being built because of zoning regulations in cities and towns across the country who are, frankly, a lot of NIMBY liberals. Now, those are the biggest those are the biggest opponents to getting housing under control is the NIMBY liberal, the not in my backyard. The people who say, we need to care for all the poor, we need to help everybody. Hey, we want to build an apartment, uh, you know, we want to build some multi-unit duplexes in your area. No, that'll affect my property values. I can't have them doing that. That's the NIMBY, the not in my backyard. What we need to be doing is easing up resources so we can build more multi-unit housing and housing that are starter homes and start, you know, uh, for individuals. And we're just not getting that with the McMansion economy that we have in this country. Uh, that is a lot of that is a local issue. As President of the United States, I can argue from the bully pulpit that we would be doing that. Another thing that we would also want to do that would make home ownership more affordable and more capable for people is stop manipulating our currency via the Federal Reserve. If we ended the Federal Reserve, we wouldn't have them monkeying around with interest rates. We'd have a much more free market system in terms of real estate. There's a lot of things we can do. Uh, and a big part of that is also, again, uh, not creating conditions where we're spending trillions of dollars a year out of thin air and devaluing the money that's in that person's pocket. Because if you're saving up for that starter home and you're putting $10,000 in that savings account and in five years that $10,000 is worth you know, 60% of what it was, you can't save fast enough to be able to buy a home. Your, your currency is being devalued too quickly. And so there's a lot of things that if we brought libertarian economic philosophy into our government, you would see a much better economic condition for young people. It's why I do this. I am not doing this uh, just because I think it's a fun idea to run for president. Trust me, it's a very stressful endeavor. I'm doing it because I have nephews and nieces, and I want to make sure the world they grow up in is, in is a better place. And I think for the last 30 years or so, we've been having a government that has continued to age. <laughs> They've continued to age because it's the same people, and they're not thinking long term anymore. They don't think about the next 20 years. They think about the next two years because that's their re-election date. They maybe at best think about the next four years. I'm running as a candidate who's 39 because I'm a millennial and I want to think about the next 30 or 40 years. And I've already seen my generation getting screwed. I don't want to see the next generation get screwed. I don't want to see my nephews and nieces having to struggle to get their first home. I don't want to see them having to struggle to pay for education and get stuck in the, uh, in the student loan you know, crisis. I want to solve these problems, even if it creates pain for me and my generation now. Because trust me, any, and this is the last thing I'll say, any time we make great changes in the economy, any time we make vast changes, there's going to be pain points. To, to lie and say otherwise is wrong. But what, we are, what is absolutely true is if we moved ourselves to a libertarian governance 20 years ago, the pain would have been less than what it is today, and if we wait 20 years ago to get ourselves and our economy under control, the pain will be greater then. Do not wait for us to become Argentina, ladies and gentlemen, before we elect a libertarian president. Because let me tell you right now, as hard as Malay is working, as much work as he's doing to fix that economy, there's a lot of pain points, and it's because they delayed in fixing the problem. They kicked the can down the road far too long. And so what do we need to do as libertarians? We need to recognize, yes, there's going to be pain from changing this economy over from one that is fully statism and authoritarian into one that is a true free market economy. There will be disruption, but the disruption will be less today than it will be 20 years from now. So let's do it today. Millennials and Gen Xers and Boomers, let's fight for a better future for those kids today so that they have a better future. That's why I'm doing this. That's why I'm running. And I, uh, and I think there's a lot of things we can do to make our economy better for that next generation so they don't have to have the American dream outside of reach for them. One of the catchphrases of my campaign, chase your dreams. We want people to be able to chase those things, be able to achieve those things that right now seem just out of reach. And so let's do that together. Let's fight as libertarians for that better world. All right, let's take this last question, then we'll close it up. Oh. It's not a question, it's a comment. Oh, comment. Okay, and then we'll take one more question. Of Javier Millet himself, by your honesty and by warning people that there is a cost to be done in, in, up front, you sound exactly like him. Hey, I'll take it. Anybody that compares me to Javier Malay, I will take that. All right. The, the, the comment, just so it's on record, uh, was that, hey, 
by being honest and transparent, that's exactly what Javier Millet did, and you're doing the same thing. So kudos to you uh, for that comment. So you had a question. We'll take this last question, then we'll uh, close it up. So Dottie Boy says that he's going to put a libertarian in his cabinet if he's elected. Do you plan on putting any Republicans or Democrats? All right. So the question is, hey, Donald is going to, the Don, Donald Trump, is going to put a libertarian in his cabinet. And the question is, Chase, do you have any intentions of putting a Democrat or a Republican in your ca uh, cabinet? It's a good question, actually. You know, uh, first, uh, if, if uh, I'm offered the position, uh, I would, uh, so I've been asked this question, would I take the position if Trump offered me a role in his cabinet if he were elected? The answer is yes, I would. And I would also say the same if Kamala Harris offered me a cabinet position, because putting a libertarian in a cabinet position would be quite fun. Do I think I would last the job? Probably not. I'd be fired in a week. You'd say, you're fired. You're doing too many freedom things. You're fired. Uh, but would I put Democrats and Republicans in my cabinet? The answer is probably yes. And here's why. Because they would still have to be going under what our policy prescriptions are. Would I put a Republican in, uh, in charge of, I don't know, say a department that's gonna be focused on you know, something where there's great areas of agreement? I might wanna do that. If for no other reason to show that a libertarian is not afraid to work with other people. I think we don't need to be afraid to being able to reach across the aisle. And frankly, if I were elected libertarian, there'd be an awful lot of Democrats and Republicans in Congress I'd have to deal with on an everyday basis. Would my cabinet be made of a majority of them? No. There might be one or two. But what we're going to do is we're going to find great libertarians to fight for these things. And let me tell you one or two great positions that we really need a libertarian in. We really need a libertarian to be the Attorney General of the United States. We really need somebody who's going to represent people's individual liberty uh, as the quote unquote chief law enforcement officer. If I were president, my pick would be a libertarian who has served time as a criminal defense attorney. Somebody who's been on the other side of the courtroom who understands the pressures of being a defense attorney and respects the individual rights of each and every defendant that they are innocent until proven guilty. Uh, if I were to put a libertarian in charge of the Department of Defense, you best believe it's going to be a veteran of the war on terror years who's going to be in charge of the Department of Defense, who knows exactly the cost of sending good young men and women to go fight in wars, especially foolhardy wars they don't need to be fighting in. And so I would find a libertarian who's just as anti-war as I am in that position. But yeah, would there be room for Democrats and Republicans? I think there needs to be, because there are Democrats and Republicans in this country, and if a libertarian truly wants to represent the American people, they need to find Democrats and Republicans who agree with them on policy positions and push those forward so we can continue to shift the Overton window, whether you're a Democrat, Republican, Libertarian, or Independent, in the direction of liberty. Awesome. Uh, appreciate everybody coming out today. Chase, give us your final words before we close the show out. My final words are, you need to vote for me on November 5th. No, uh, my, my final words here is, if you want to learn more about the campaign, go to votechasealver.com. We're doing our get out the vote efforts right now. We need your assistance to knock on doors, do text banking, do phone banking. And if you're not in a position to do those things, we would love your support. Go to votechasealver.com, go to donate, and make sure you're supporting libertarian candidates up and down the ballot in whatever state you're in. Uh, we've heard a little from Fina, who's out in the audience here running for U.S. Senate here in the state of Florida. She is among a great number of awesome libertarians who are running for U.S. U.S. Senate across this country. We have awesome gubernatorial candidates, House candidates, state House candidates, mayoral candidates, county commission candidates. You name the race, there's a good chance that there's a libertarian running in one of those races across this country. So find who they are, support them, and support the message of liberty, both here at home and around the world. And uh, let's fight for a world that's rooted in the idea of non-aggression. All right. All right, and so in closing, uh, I would just like to say, um, you know, make sure, folks, that you are subscribed to my YouTube channel or my Rumble channel. You can go to youtube.libertydad.com or you can go to rumble.libertydad.com. While you're there, you know, make sure you subscribe, like, hit that bell so that you don't miss an episode. And last but not least, as you go about your week, I want you to remember that if you are a champion of liberty, your business is people and your product is liberty. I want you to have a great week. Catch you next time, but for now, we're out.